Okay, so this one is about the nature of evil. And this is a controversial one because we fear evil so much. We're so resistant to it. We refuse to look at it. We refuse to even acknowledge it. To the point where every time we're confronted with it, in society in some way, we just don't want to look at it. And it makes sense, of course. Why would we want to see how abhorrent our nature is? Because there are aspects of our nature that is that are abhorrent. Despicable, evil. There's just no other word for it. Evil is the only word to sum it up. Someone commits a horrendous act, something like mass murder, for example. And the last thing we want to do is to look at it. The last thing we want to do is to acknowledge that that is in our nature. It's part of our nature but we've become so good at ignoring it. If we turn a blind eye, we can pretend that it doesn't exist. Nonetheless, it does exist. And when these atrocities happen, The most action that we take is to change our Facebook profile to say this is not who we are, as if that's somehow going to negate it, as if standing against it is somehow going to solve the problem at the root cause. All that's going to happen when we ignore the issue is it'll happen again and we'll all change our Facebook profiles again to say this is not who we are. We'll distance ourselves from the issue, pretend that pure evil is not part of our nature and then just wait for it to blow over again. That is the truth of how we deal with it. We go through all the ceremonial things and all the people who have been affected beyond belief whose lives have been changed forever. Nothing was really done to protect them. Because the only way, the only way we're ever going to protect the future victims of crimes like mass murder is to look right into the eye of the beast to stare right at it and to say to it, I am going to understand you. I'm not going to stop turning my gaze towards you until I understand you. Because it is not until we understand the truth of the nature of evil that we're ever going to be able to reconcile it or influence our environment in ways where the nature of evil doesn't just arise. All of us have the potential and the capability to be evil. We just don't understand its nature. We don't understand the cause of it, what is it that causes the nature of evil to arise so that it it is expressed in ways like mass murder. Distancing ourselves from these issues is never going to resolve them. Collectively, we know 
that these are not things that we want to experience. Collectively, we know that we want to protect people from being victims of this kind of evil in the future. We know that. We don't need to come together and vote. We all know that. We want to protect each other. We want to make sure it's not going to happen again. But we can't think that changing our Facebook profile photo is part of any form of solution. We have to realize and accept that putting distance between ourselves and the issue is the very opposite of resolving the issue. We have to turn our gaze towards the root of that evil with the intention to understand it. With the intention to claim it as a part of us. Together, when we're unified, we are one body of people. And so there's a part of our body that's expressing pure evil. It's sick. And so if it was part of your own body that was sick, you wouldn't just ignore it because it would fester. It would, or it would spread. Or possibly even overwhelm you and take your life. Threaten your well-being. If left ignored for long enough. We can't ignore this anymore. Not if we want to actually thrive. As one body of people. And so what I'm going to invite you to do is to join me now and turn your gaze towards the evil and invite it in. Invite it to reveal the truth of what it is. Be unconditionally present with it and ask it, what is it that you want me to know? What is your essence? What is your nature? Because understand there is a part of you that is evil, I promise you. Most of us will have ignored the, the part of us that is evil for the majority of our lives. There's far too much guilt and shame attached to the, these parts of us that are evil to admit that we actually have them, but we do, but it's repressed. It is deeply repressed. But when I say, and I've said in my other audios, that the brightest light is contained within the deepest shadows, the darkest shadows. And this is true. This is true. We just don't have the courage to look right within it, to understand the essence of it, to understand the nature of it for long enough for it to reveal that light. Because if we ignore it, then it just grows and grows and grows until we've got no choice to address it because it's staring us right in the face, threatening to overwhelm us until we have the courage to finally look at or until our choices are taken away. And we have no choice but to look at it by experiencing the truth of it, by having our noses rubbed in the face of it. We can't continue to let our society just erode in front of our eyes by creating distance between ourselves and the root cause of the issue. And so the million dollar question is, if evil is the darkest shadow that we have, 
then what is this the brightest light contained within it? <laughs> And so I'm going to, in this moment, I'm going to address the part of me that is evil and I'm going to reveal it to you on this audio using a technique called aspect integration. There's lots of different names for it. People, um, there's lots of different um, practitioners who have a different spin on it. Um, as you get more and more used to it, you begin to realize that um, they're always there within you. But before I do it, I just want to preface this with um, just to explain how, how consciousness works. Because consciousness, the nature of consciousness, it's like um, an organism in that it's continually split splitting and splitting just fragmenting over and over again you know if you imagine a river and the water running down that river and then it then the creeks running off it it's for, it's kind of similar with consciousness in that when there is the purpose and the role of consciousness of the mind is to contain the spirit and to protect the spirit because its essence is purity. It's devoid of perception. It's devoid of um, any form of limitation. And what that means is it has the potential to become anything. It's infinite in nature, it's infinite in its potential because it is devoid of perception. Therefore, nothing can limit it. And so what happens is consciousness as a container for this spirit is it is continually determining what is what could hold the potential to limit its expansion. So it's almost like a, a form of artificial intelligence that's programmed to um, protect the spirit from a truth that could impair its ability to continue evolving and becoming more and more and more and more. And the re and a classic example is you know a, a three year old child. Um, uh, who's abused um, and then is dis dissociates from that experience, doesn't really remember, may, um, may remember it as nightmares. So dissociation is a, is a classic form of coping mechanism where the, um, the experience is distorted. So the truth is distorted so that the spirit is protected from the reality of that truth. Because the reality of that truth is that, you know, the person that's supposed to love and protect that child um, is its biggest enemy. And that could destroy a child. And so the dissociation allows the child to continue surviving because the parent still provides the food and, you know, the shelter and all these things. And so the dissociation is the only way for that spirit to continue evolving without it shutting down completely, because the truth is too um, traumatic to accept. You know, a three-year-old child doesn't have the skills to reconcile um, the reality of that truth. So, you know, many of us are busy trying to create ego death and trying to, um, uh, you know, um, deal with the inner narcissist and with the inner bully and 
what most people don't understand is that <laughs> the deception of the mind, when it deceives, when it becomes narcissistic, it is just protecting. Um, it is just protecting the spirit from the reality of the truth. It's an act of love. It's just nature arising. Deception is found everywhere in nature. Camouflage, you know, a specific uh, breed of butterfly that looks like a poisonous berry. Deception is an extremely effective way of ensuring the survival of any species so that it may continue to become more and more and more and evolve and thrive. So next time you find yourself beating yourself up, for not being authentic. Just remember that inauthenticity is authentic in the presence of fear. Inauthenticity is authentic in the presence of a potentially traumatic experience. Just understand that. It's no need to beat yourself up for telling a lie it's protection. You don't have to beat yourself up for not being totally authentic all the time. Because when you're ready, when your spirit's ready, when it's when you're evolved enough to accept the reality of the actual truth, there are tools like inner child work, there are tools like regression, there are tools like what I use, which is I sink into my emotions until they become a vision. Once you get advanced at these things. And you evolve as your nature arises. Nothing to do, nothing to change. You're not doing anything wrong. There's not a huge rush. Just allow yourself to evolve into the truth of who you are. You're not doing anything wrong. Everything you're doing now in your life is because of your nature and your nature is arising because of where you've come from and because of where you are right now and the environment you are in right now. Yes, it is deterministic. All of nature is. Everything that contains life is programmed to thrive, to conquer its environment. In order to conquer your environment, you have to be capable of surviving. If you are to become more and more of what you have the potential to become, you have to protect yourself first and even from protect yourself from the truth if it could cause you harm. That's what narcissism is. Smoke and mirrors. <laughs> protecting. Protecting the spirit from the truth. So. Back to the subject of evil. So evil, you could describe it as to cause pain for seemingly no reason at all, possibly even for pleasure. And it, it may seem like that, but that's not actually the case. Because with evil, what happens is the nature of evil is that it is an expression of mercy. 
it's an expression of mercy and it's this is a very specific um emotion that arises and it's because if we perceive that a higher power or an authority that has power over us or control over us, whether that's the belief in a God, whether it's you know to do with a government or some kind of higher power or authority, it's when there's a belief that that power is the source of our suffering. So if we believe in that first and foremost, and believe me, basically in, within your DNA, you will have ancestors who have absolutely believed in this. Um, and so you'll have elements of these, of the remnants of these perceptions of their environment held within your DNA, even if you don't believe in a higher power right now. And so if, you, if your nature arises to form a perception that, that that power is the cause of your suffering, then the, um, the emotion of mercy, the nature of mercy when it arises, it wants to eradicate um, that source of suffering. It wants to destroy it, in fact even to the point of annihilate it, if it could. So here you have a scenario where the root cause of all evil, the root cause of all evil, it arises from the emotion of mercy for wanting to destroy that power because it is perceived as the source of the suffering of the of the individual, so you, it doesn't take long to figure, you know, to follow the breadcrumbs. The United States, all the territories they're trying to occupy, a powerful brute force that can't be stopped, that has power over you. your nature is going to arise. If you see that power as the source of your suffering, mercy kicks in, and you cannot stop it. It's your nature. It's your nature arising. As an act of mercy, you want to end the suffering, even if it means destroying the source of that suffering. Mercy is ruthless. just is. We all have the potential to express it. Now, when it comes to perceptions of a higher power, such as a god or some form of power that um, has total control over your life, in your life, in your day-to-day -day life, you're suffering. But, so you've got this anger and this, this pure evil festering within you, wanting to annihilate the source of that suffering. But you're so ashamed of it, and you're so scared of the wrath of this power. <laughs> You're never going to express it. Never. And so it just festers and it grows. We ignore it. Because that's, that's the main way that human beings address it, is we just ignore it. We just keep ignoring it, ignoring it, ignoring it. Oh my God, I could never acknowledge this. I'm too ashamed. And, you know, shame and guilt are powerful emotions. You know, many of us would... Um, rather die than bear our souls to do with certain things. And when religion's involved, obviously it's much more complex. 
But at least if we can understand the nature of mercy, we understand we can we understand that whatever the sources of the suffering, whether we're assuming what the source of the suffering is, or whether it truly is the source of our suffering, then evil is is being bred, just festering. And this is why it's so important to move towards, to start moving towards a society that is self-governing, that's based on individual sovereignty where you, you're self-reliant, you can govern yourself to a large degree, that you don't have to, you don't, there aren't, you know, powerful authorities that um, have control over you because they have the potential if they cause oppression and any form of suffering, they have the potential to cause evil to begin gestating and festering and it has to be expressed. It has to be expressed and you can reconcile it if you have the skills, but you have to be able to be evolved enough to claim that I am evil and who is? Who has evolved enough to claim that part of themselves? To claim the I am of that, I am evil, I am pure evil. There's so much shame bound bound up in it. But it's the truth, you are evil. You are evil. You have the potential to express the absolute depths of evil. If a powerful authority, a government, a higher power, if you believed that that was the source of your suffering, you could not stop the evil from rising up within you. It's not possible. It's your nature. In the same way that a fish can swim, you are evil. It just is. So what kind of society do we want to live in? Do we want to start dismantling the source of of evil, the reason it starts? Do you want to start challenging your assumptions about nature, some form of higher power or God that has total control and power over you, that you pray to, that you ask to help you, that you're just giving your power away to relentlessly. Please help me. Please help me. Asking this power for forgiveness, asking this power for what it is you want. You are the creator. You are the creator. Everything in your reality is a projection of the state of your of your conscious awareness within you. Yes, you are part of something much, much bigger and more powerful. But you are sovereign within that. You are totally sovereign within that. The only thing that con- that controls you are aspects of your consciousness that ha- you haven't been brought into your conscious awareness yet. And so they're influencing you for sure. But the power and all of the influence comes from you. Because meaning is the only thing that materializes matter. Meaning. You know, there are lots of different ways that people talk about manifesting and, you know, using alchemy and, you know, the search for the Holy Grail and um, what do you call it? The, um, you know, the secret and, um, oh, what's that other one? 
the law of attraction. <laughs> oh man, this and it's everyone's searching for the secret recipe. But it's just so much more simple than that. It's so much more simple. You know, there's there's certain techniques and sciences behind, you know, you should breathe a certain way first. And, you know, if you want what you if you want to create something that you really want, then you have to say affirmations and be holding the energy of what it is that you want. There's so much confusion. And because everyone's trying all these things and none of it's actually working, we're, we're just always searching for that magic wand that we just wave the magic wand and we say the right words or do the right combination of breathing and um, affirmations and um, guided meditations. And somehow that's going to work. The reality is, is that meaning is the only force in existence that materializes matter, meaning. And when you become, when you're practiced enough where you can find, when you can go within yourself to find the entire universe, you can go back to the moment before meaning even existed. It's just a void, a total void, devoid of anything. And you can go into the moment where the first form of the first substance and form of matter arose. And that what preceded it was meaning. Meaning materializes matter, matter arises from meaning. It's like the double slit experiment where um, where the photonic where the photon beha behaves like a wave when it's not being observed and then it behaves like a particle the moment it's observed <laughs> it's it's just so simple it's so simple It is our perspective of what it means to observe that photon that materializes it into form. What do I believe it will mean once I observe it? And that's what materializes it into form. Meaning is all that matters. It's all that matters. And if you just remember that it's the meaning is the union of masculine and feminine, of thoughts and, and emotions, it's the marriage of both. And actually, maybe it's worthwhile sharing because some people don't, it can be a bit tricky to understand what meaning is. So I can, here's an example. At the moment, I'm actually lying in bed. And um, if I was to describe the bed to you, I would say, so I would describe it like this. I'm lying on a bed, it's got a white duvet on top of it. It's got four posts and it's got this really strange archway thing in the middle. Whoever built it, um, built it out of trees that came from off the property here. And they've been painted white. And it's got this crisscross pattern that's been made of branches on the top. And so lots of people create like this. They describe, and describing something is is devoid of meaning. It's devoid of meaning. Because what it means for me to be lying on this bed, it means I can be totally relaxed while I'm recording this audio. 
it means I can reflect on the day that I've had while I'm lying in bed and recording this podcast. It means that I'm totally at peace and I'm totally warm because it's cold outside. It means that um, my muscles are nice and relaxed. So it's the meaning is, is what actually matters. It's the, and this is the only way to live with meaning is to make choices where you're conscious of the outcome of that choice. If I do this, it means that. That's the only way to live with meaning. And this is why people think that achieving a goal is actually where fulfillment is. And it can be rewarding, but often empty. You know, lots of athletes talk about when they won their gold medal, about how empty it felt. And, you know, the reality is it's the meaning that that matters. And you can create meaning right now. You know, if you received a vision for something that you wanted, you could create meaning straight away by um, looking at what that vision is and then filling the space in between where you are now and where where that scenario is, filling the space in between in your mind, imagining it, and then taking one step towards realizing that vision that you know is going to take you one step closer. That's how you create meaning. If I do this, it means that I'm even closer to realizing my vision. And if I do that, once I've done that, it means I can then do that. And once I've done that, it means I can then do that. That's how you live with meaning. <laughs> it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. Um, the hardest part is giving yourself permission to go after what you want. And, and also validating what you want yourself. You know, rather than waiting for some authority or some other power to give you permission to just, rather than sitting there waiting for a sign or um, waiting for inspiration, there's a choice you can take right now that contains meaning that will get you closer to a vision that you already have right now. There's always something. Even to the point where it may not be something that you do. It may be that there is something that you want to do. There is a vision that you have and there are lots of things that you want to do. And it may be that right now in this moment, I'm you're completely tired. And so if I go to bed and have a nap now, it means that when I wake up, I'll feel totally refreshed and ready to then go and do this. Meaning is all that matters. And your vision is yours. It holds the key to your fulfillement and that, and that it enables you to take steps forward that have meaning. And every time you take that step, because it has meaning, it will feel fulfilling, no matter how small it is. Okay. <laughs> so that's a bit about evil and a bit about meaning. Um, and in case you didn't realize, um, I, I'm, I don't endorse um, any form of higher power or authority having control over myself. It's up to you whether you want to, but the choice is yours because meaning is all that matters. Okay, cheers for now.